sent to heal the contract. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. So may Almighty God have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life in Jesus Christ our Lord.
Whoever serves me must follow me, says the Lord. And where I am, there will my servant be. The Holy Gospel is taken from that of St. John, beginning at chapter 12, and verses 20 to 33. Among those who went up to worship at the festival, were some Greeks. They painted Philip, who was from the sailor in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has not come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glory by your name. And a voice from heaven came. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd was standing there, heard it, and said, It was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to me. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the gospel of the Lord. Gospel actually 
actually gives him the answer. Though I'll be talking mainly to the Jeremiah reading in chapter uh, 37, verses 31 to 34. The message Jeremiah has throughout his book is there's something wrong with us. The prophet Jeremiah had spent the earlier chapters declaring God's indignation for the chosen people, Israel and Judah. Railing against each being unable and or unwilling to follow the ways of God. Sounds a bit familiar. This was despite the laws laid out by the teachers and the prophets who were enshrined in scriptures. This Old Testament, Testament covenant with God's people would have to be renewed. It was going to make us into the people we should be. In other words, there's something wrong with this people and also with you. So let's start again. Beginning of the Old Testament, these were scriptures that were available in Jeremiah's time. You would see that in Genesis that God created all the earth and it was very good. Now we tend to gloss over the fact that the world as God saw it was very good. It's not perfect. Creation itself needs to be nurtured and prayed for, even to remain good. Never mind perfect. Was this perhaps too much to hope for? That God's people remain very good? By the time of Jeremiah, it was certainly looking as if that created order, as overseen by humanity, fallen and broken, beyond repair, initially pursued by humanity and God's prophets. Law was not enough. Indeed, God had provided the prophets and leaders to write the law of God into the scriptures, admittedly still forming at the time of Jeremiah, but something had gotten wrong. Now there's a book I uh, will turn to uh, later in the season uh, by um, theologian who's died in book, uh, Colin Gunter, it's the actuality of atonement. And uh, Gunter looks at what went wrong when God's law was presented to humanity. Because that's what Jeremiah said, there's something wrong with this law, and you have to write a new one in your heart. Gunter, uh, comes to the conclusion that essentially the human desire to control meant that social systems of laws and politics appropriated the biblical laws into their own system of control. You can hear the prison chapter that he's speaking out here. So using the language of religion and Christianity to legit legitimize human law and control. These interpretations of the society then become a social bedrock affecting people, even the people of the church. And it suddenly under, undermined really the influence and interpretation of what God's law actually said and what we need to do to fulfill God's law. Gunter gives the example, uh, clearly. Uh, obvious example of the Christian Crusades, where winning battles, murdering people, was paramount, when in fact Christian faith is based on self-giving through the sacrificial death of Christ. Such is in total conflict, the Crusades would be defined with a different number, Christ saying that we should die to self. That's what happens when the law gets interpreted and we start fighting our battles rather than what God wants us to do in that situation. Personal desire, the self-confidence and realisation is so powerful it becomes a false with God's will. Instead of reliance on the law of God to free us from life, laws are seen as opportunities for punishment or rebellion. External law imposed on us is thus corrupted and broken. That's where Jeremiah was when he said, I'll have to write a new law. 
So Jeremiah's written two chapters, largely contained rants against the way the law of God was corrupted or abandoned. But it turns on these four verses, very special four verses, in chapter 31. There will come a time when God will make a new covenant, not upon the covenant on external law, but upon the covenant written within each human being, written on our heart. Now, the word hearts in verse 33 might be better translated as sort of heart minds because uh, the heart was considered in those days a seat of understanding rather than today simply a romantic sense of uh, bloody heavy heart, it's a sort of a heart intellectual. Such law will be written within us. As such, it will not be then directly affected by the winds of society or politics. Those in power, those human beings in power. It puts God's desire for us to observe God's plans and God's delight in us back into the realm of the relationship what God speaks to me and He speaks to God. Of course, this time has come. Jesus came and died on the cross for all our breaking the law, for all our sin. And that by the Holy Spirit, the law is now written in our hearts. Our relationship with God is now, with God, come to meet us in the Son, Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, who broke the law by saying, I forgive you. But, but this is maybe something we need to take on. There remains a problem. Yes, each of us has access directly to the law of love and relationship with God in our heart and minds by the Holy Spirit, direct communication. That's a blessing from all of us. And the but is, does it now lead to individualism and personal interpretation of what that relationship means for every human being? Isn't there going to be disunity because of that? And what of those who willfully, or due to misunderstanding, trauma, or pain, do not respond to the love of God written on their heart minds? The problem is shown up and made plain by the number of Christian denominations that abound today. If we all have the law of God inscribed within us, then ideally we should all have to agree. One God speaks to each other. Remember, we were made by God and we were recognized God by God as very good, but we remain broken. We're not perfect. But that is exactly what the brokenness of Jesus owned on the cross for us. Even in a broken world, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead to show that error and even death will not be end. Because of the gift of Jesus Christ into our humanity, God has granted not only the possibility of relationship with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but also into fellowship with one another. Indeed, the New Testament continually exalts us to pray with one another, to read letters and messages, not just from the scriptures, but from and in one another in our fellowship. If Lenin and Khan be saying, a while ago now, we can work it out. This special relationship Christians have with God and Jesus Christ is even better than perfection. That's the note. Brokenness can be redeemed, and our brokenness made whole, not through our relationship with God in Jesus, not only through our relationship, I used to use the word that, not only through our relationship with God in Jesus Christ, but also through our relationship with one another, all of us. Even the Christians we find difficult. We are God's gift to one another. That's 
quite so sad. When Christians, when we talk to one another, when they see the others we got trying to wrong. Really, we need to be tender for fellowship, especially in our understanding of faith and each other. These churches, where you say the things you think, I'm not really sure about, you know, what you said about this, and this, you're blind. Why don't we discuss it? We're not acting in love. We don't listen to one another just as much as if we didn't listen to God. What a privilege that is to be human. To be angels that spells messages to one another. Even when not one of us has perfection of faith in us. But we have a relationship with the third of God and one another. Now, when we have the perfect relationship with God, the law will make full sense. So, in fact, it is true what Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law, set up in Matthew 5, verse 17. The only trouble is we don't yet have that perfection. That's probably the only thing to say. But with fellowship in love, we can receive the forgiveness and redemption. So the law written on our, our minds becomes God's will for us. The law, the truth, is superseded, and the evil ones know the law. So, despite our continued imperfections, through Jesus Christ and in communion or fellowship with one another, what is broken and wrong is redeemed and made wrong. So, the opposite of the heart again, in Jesus Christ and in loving fellowship with one another, there's something right for you. And also, Amen. Amen. We believe.
And Lord, we earnestly pray for the day when our priesthood shepherd, Father David, may lead us again. Bless and uphold him in his time of waiting. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving God, we count our blessings and thank and praise you for the great beauty and wonder of your creation, for the lights in the sky and all the creatures who dwell therein, for the forests and meadows and gardens of the land, and all the creatures who dwell thereon, for the rivers and the seas and all the watering places, and all that swim and die within. We repent of the ways in which we, humankind, have been poor stewards of all that you have made, and of all in which you delighted. And we pray that you may lead us in the new ways of sharing all of the blessings of your creation, and of caring for it well. We pray for a time of recreation and restoration of all the wonders that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we count our blessings and thank and praise you for our lives and for all that we have achieved by your grace and for all that we have yet to do. We delight in all our families and friends and in all the lovely people who have given us to share our lives with, and we give thanks to them. We pray that you may be present in the midst of all of our relationships, and that we may grow and in love and joy and peace. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. loving God, we count our blessings and thank and praise you for our general well-being. But we pray now for those we love, who are in need of your healing grace today. And we pray for the healing of our own bodies, minds, and souls. We pray especially for the, uh, the family of Michael in Borneo and for Vivian, giving thanks for her life as she was there yesterday. We pray for Caroline's mother Julia in hospital, and for Mark's brother Simon also in hospital. And now we pray, we bring our own prayers to the Lord. came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. They were glad when they saw the Lord. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Take eat. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in the memory of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave it to them. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is born again. And so the perfect Father, according to mine, his death upon the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for his coming in glory. We celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We bring before you this bread, this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people. We will gather into one in your kingdom, all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honour and glory be yours, almighty and perfect God, forever and ever. Amen. So let us pray, sit and pray, with confidence to the Father in the words of our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us your heart. Thy name is the 
Would those of you at home please join with us in this prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the Blessed Sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into my heart. As if you were already there, I embrace you and unite myself wholly to you. Permit not that I should ever be separated from you. Amen. Christ, you have taught us that what we do for the least of our sisters and brothers, we do also for you. Give us the will to be the servant of others, as you were the servant of all, and gave up your life and died for us. But our life remain now and forever. Almighty God, we thank you for giving us the body and blood of your Son Jesus Christ. Let him take upon you from our souls' bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us an hand and our spirit to live everywhere and your praise name. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit fill you and remain with you, those you love and those you find difficult to love. Stay and evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may be God.